Hello everyone. Today we're talking five ways with the CNI. I'm Stig Telfer. I'm CTO of a technical consultancy business called Stack HPC. We specialize in high performance cloud infrastructure and platforms for scientific computing. And I'm Erez Cohen. I'm responsible for cloud networking at NVIDIA. Uh, in this talk, we will discuss and compare some of the most common Kubernetes networking configurations for performance intensive workloads. High performance computing or HPC is a field of computer science that solves complex problems such as fluid dynamics for aircraft design, for example, large scale weather forecast or drug discovery through the use of large scale compute simulations. HPC is one of the most compute network and storage intensive workloads. Technologies developed for HPC often make their way to more standard data center applications. Another example of compute intensive applications are artificial intelligence or AI. AI is probably the greatest revolution of our time. It allows computers to solve problems that only a few years ago seemed impossible. AI can create images and text from human description, translate languages, recommend specific items from wealth of options, and even write code. AI is very common these days and used in many web services and other common applications. Both AI and HPC <clears throat> are compute intensive. Uh, and they typically cannot run on a single server. They require a cluster of servers uh, and run as a distributed application. Uh, when we're running application in that fashion, networking become a critical element for the proper execution of the application. When we're looking at the network consideration, uh, the first and foremost is throughput or bandwidth. And here we would like to have as much as we can. Today we're running at 100 gig and uh, going forward, we're already deploying 400 gigabit per second. But latency and the predictability of latency is, is as important for those kind of workloads. And obviously we would like to have low and predictable latency across all packet types. When we're running a lot of uh, uh, networking, the CPU is uh, very busy with the network itself and consumes quite a lot of cores, CPU cores. Um, we would like obviously to free up those CPU for running the application itself. And therefore we're looking for CPU offload capabilities so that the networking will be handled by the NIC and not by the CPU. And lastly, in many of those application environments, GPUs are in play. And we'd like to make sure that not only the CPU can access the network properly, but also the GPU. Technologies like GPU Direct become very important. RDMA can address a lot of those uh, requirements, and I'll explain RDMA. RDMA, or Remote Direct Memory Access, is a transport service, same layer as the TCP and UDP, but it is a more uh, modern one. Uh, in addition to send and receive, it also supports memory read and write semantics, which allows us to write uh, very efficient applications. It also supports natively kernel bypass, which allows to reduce significantly the latency so the application can send and receive without going through the kernel. And it supports natively uh, uh, hardware offloads with the right hardware, like the NVIDIA hardware, for example, uh, which allows us to transfer uh, hundreds of gigabits per second without any CPU intervention. RDMA was designed initially for technology called InfiniBand, uh, but for a long time now, it's also available on Ethernet under the name of Rocky. RDMA over converged Ethernet. In this talk, we'll see how Rocky can be used with Kubernetes. Now let's uh, review the various network configurations uh, that we will use for this talk, and we'll start with Calico. Calico is a popular open source networking and network security platform for Kubernetes created by Tigera. Uh, Calico addresses connectivity between pods, 
to pods and pods to servers and servers to pods and then and it and it includes uh, ingress and egress load balancing calico also provides network security features which is out of the scope of our talk today calico has a central controller that calculate the policies and routes and store them in an etcd data store on each node calico runs three components uh, confd which uh, monitors the etcd data store for configuration changes and update bird configuration files felix which configures ip tables and linux routes based on the policies and connectivity and bird uh, which is an open source bgp agent which advertise felix routes calico supports both bgp and vxlan routing uh, in our talk, we will use VXLAN overlay. Uh, in addition, Calico have two data path implementation, standard Linux, which uses Linux route and IP table, as I said before, and uh, eBPF, which is extended Berkeley packet filters. Uh, for our talk, we use the standard Linux option. The next CNI is OVN Kubernetes. Uh, OVN Kubernetes is the OVN CNI for Kubernetes environment, naturally. Um, it uses OVN, Open Virtual Networking, which is an open source SDN controller um, that uses OVS. It's from the same project. Uh, OVN uses logical components such as uh, switches and routers. Um, it has support security and access control list, uh, load balancers, and many other features. Um, OVN programs OVS data as, a, as its data plane. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with OVS, OVS is a virtual switch of, that is flow-based, meaning it can be programmed to implement most of the data plane elements of switches and routers. Uh, next CNI is SRIOV. Uh, single root IO virtualization or SRIOV is a PCI technology which allows to segment a PCI device into virtual devices and assign them to the pod or VM through uh, a virtual function, which exposes basically the device or sub device into the, the, the pod or the, uh, the VM. Um, in networking, the device is pretty simple, even though it can support advanced capabilities like RDMA, uh, the networking element is pretty simple and it behaves like a Mac VLAN. Uh, there's no overlay, no SDN capabilities, other than uh, basic uh, switching and uh, quality of service uh, for virtual function. However, uh, SRV provide us with very, very high performance close to bare metal, as it bypassed the entire virtualization stack. Uh, to use uh, SRIV in Kubernetes, we're using the SRIV CNI, and also, in addition, the SRIV device plugin. Um, SRIV CNI cannot uh, uh, support the, all the network requirements of a pod, and therefore it is used typically as a secondary CNI. And uh, primary CNI like Calico or OVN, uh, in together with uh, primary CNI as Calico or OVN, through the use of Multus, which is a meta plugin, or meta CNI. Next, next configuration is accelerated OVN. Uh, before I explain the technology, let's first understand the challenges of software-based virtual switches. OVS is built of two components, a kernel model and a user space daemon. When a packet comes in, it will go to the kernel module or the fast path and classify the packet and see if there is a rule what to do with that packet. If there is a rule, the packet will be executed, meaning will be sent to the pod or do something else. If there is a miss, this packet will go to the user space daemon uh, for further uh, analysis. And once a decision is made what to do with this new flow, it will program the, the, the kernel data plane. And from that point on, packets will 
just go through the fast path. Now, both the uh, kernel, the, the kernel module, and the user space daemon are CPU running on the CPU. And the uh, uh, general purpose CPU is not very good in processing high rate of packets. And therefore, OVS and many of the other uh, virtual switches are uh, have very low bandwidth and very high latency and high CPU utilization. In addition, um, because the interface uh, to the pod or to the VM is uh, ETH pair, uh, none of the advanced features of the modern NICs are supported, like RDMA and DPDK and so on. To address these challenges, NVIDIA added to our NICs an embedded switch. OVS was enhanced through a set of API to program that embedded switch on the NIC uh, and program its data plane. The pods are now connected directly to the NIC through advanced SRIOV mode called eSwitch mode. Every packet that comes from the network will hit the eSwitch first and will classify the packets there. If there is a rule that defines what to do with that, the packet will be executed and be sent to the pod and vice versa. If there is no such rule, the packet will go into OVS kernel module and from there will continue just like before. With this approach, we actually can have the cake and eat it too. Um, we have one primary CNI, OVN in this case, that supports all the capabilities needed for Kubernetes, all the Kubernetes services all the network services, the quality of service and visibility and so on. It supports bonding, which legacy SRIV does not, and it supports security. But unlike the virtual switches and other CNIs that are software-based, it provides bare metal performance of the server. And in addition, it provides additional capabilities that the network adapter may have, such as RDMA and DPDK. So those were the configuration that we will run in our lab. Let me just explain what lab did we build. We actually built two labs, one for uh, Kubernetes bare metal and one for Kubernetes over OpenStack. On the Kubernetes over bare metal, we have two worker nodes. Uh, the servers are quite high end uh, for the performance benchmarking. We're running HP DL380 Gen 10 with uh, 8380 CPUs, uh, two NUMAs, each one of 40 cores, so overall 80 cores, and half a, a terabyte of uh, RAM. And those devices are, and those servers running NVIDIA Connectix 6DX with two ports of 100 gigabit each. Uh, on the OS, we're running Ubuntu 20.04 with latest kernel and the NVIDIA OFED for latest uh, uh, networking drivers. Kubernetes version is 1.23.7 and we deployed with KubeSpray. And the pod is running Ubuntu again with uh, the OFED packages. Um, the network interfaces are bonded and we're running at 9K MTU. Connecting to a switch and a, a SN 3700, uh, 32 ports of up to 200 gigabit per second, so plenty of uh, interfaces running Cumulus Linux 4.4. Uh, the master node is uh, a lower grade server uh, running Ubuntu 20.04 and the same Kubernetes uh, version. So this is the uh, bare metal environment. The Kubernetes over OpenStack environment is uh, obviously the same hardware, two compute nodes, but this time on the operating system, we did install Yoga OpenStack and uh, we created a VM running Ubuntu 20.04 and the latest kernels and, and offered packages. And inside the VM, we basically deployed the same Kubernetes as before, and then obviously the pods running in that Kubernetes. Uh, the switches and uh, all the rest is exactly the same. Uh, of course, in the controller node, we did need to install uh, OpenStack Yoga controller.
Now the, the networking on the nested environment, uh, Kubernetes over OpenStack is a little bit uh, tricky. Um, we don't have the Connectix device and inside the host we're running OVN with OVS offload. So this OVS is offloaded the data plane into the Connectix as I explained before. Inside the VM we're running Calico, which is connected to the OVS non-accelerated and that's the primary network for the pod. And in addition, we have a secondary OVN, uh, uh, SRIOV network going to the pod. Um, and so the application can use RDMA, which basically goes to the virtual function and then will go out through the NIC with the rules and the SDN layers of the OVS. Or it can use either the TCP from the net device of the virtual function, and then it's accelerated, or from the Calico, which is non-accelerated. And with this, uh, I would like to uh, hand it to Stig to discuss our uh, benchmarks and results. We have an awesome lab environment. Now we need to define some representative test cases. Eris mentioned those key considerations for networking, high bandwidth, low latency, low CPU overhead and predictable fairness under contention. We created a suite of test cases that should be both insightful and representative for HPC and AI applications. This benchmark suite is also open source and available on GitHub today under this link. It uses the Volcano job scheduler to run through a set of test cases and extract results in an automated and repeatable process. It uses Kubeflow's MPI operator to orchestrate the execution of those parallel applications that we're benchmarking. First up, we can start on familiar ground by benchmarking TCP performance using the ubiquitous iPerf benchmark. We use version two of the application here. We measure aggregate TCP bandwidth for increasing numbers of concurrent iPerf clients. In these tests, we're using pod-to-pod -pod networking, which is more representative for these scenarios, rather than include service IPs, which would not be representative for most of our use cases. I'm plotting the individual client bandwidth here as a stacked bar. This shows us fairness. Even fairness results in even width stripes, and it's fairly easy to see that. The aggregate bandwidth is the total height of the bar. All the graphs are scaled to the physical limits of our lab networking hardware, 200 gigabits a second per server. We set the scene here with the baseline performance of host networking, bypassing the CNI altogether. Now a common choice in high bandwidth networking is to increase the ethernet frame size or MTU from 1500 bytes, which is the standard, to 9000, which is known as a jumbo frame. This has the effect of increasing application bandwidth while reducing the CPU overhead of packet processing. On this slide, we have two charts measuring the effect of a 9000 byte MTU and its uplift on performance. It's actually not such a massive difference in results here, due probably to the high-end network cards that we're using. But what is not shown is the extra work behind the scenes that the host kernel is doing in packet processing load for standard frame sizes. This hidden cost is not shown in the end results, but we'll return to expose and explore this a bit later. So we've adopted a 9000 byte MTU for the benchmarks in this presentation as being considered representative of HPC networking use cases. Before we go on though, it's just amazing to see that modern hardware a modern hardware server can readily saturate 200 gigabits a second of networking. First up, let's start with the CNI results with a couple of standard choices. Two of the most popular CNIs for Kubernetes are Calico and OVN. In this slide, Calico is the chart on the left and OVN is the chart on the right. Calico is configured with default settings. We've done nothing special here. It's using VXLAN as the transport layer. OVN is configured without SDN acceleration at this stage. It's also at default settings. We'll return to the SDN acceleration shortly. The difference in performance here is stark. We can see that Calico costs almost no additional overhead 
over host networking and is delivering good fairness. Both CNIs get 30 and a half gigabits a second for a single iPerf TCP stream. But for OVN, beyond a small number of concurrent TCP streams, our performance tails off to a fraction of peak bandwidth. Why is that? We can speculate about the different fortunes of these two CNIs. For OVN, offloading performance may be impacted by Geneva encapsulation or the complexity of OVN's programmable SDN pipeline. Routing, NAT, security groups and connection tracking are all parts of a flexible solution in OVN but make it harder to apply offloads. OVN may also be affected by latent configuration in our lab environment for hardware acceleration. It's present here but not used for this test, which may be affecting the capacity of the network receive path. It's a theory but we don't have time to test it. For Calico, we appear to be getting benefit from the stateless offloads of the ConnectX6 network cards we are using. In particular, the network card can do TCP segmentation offload to a VXLAN VNI, the kind of networking used by Calico, enabling the kernel's networking stack to process network data in much bigger chunks in a Calico configuration. There's a need here for further investigation, clearly, but for lack of time. With OVN, there may well be room to improve on these results. A popular choice of CNI for high performance use cases is to use SRIOV, in which pod networking has direct access to NIC hardware. Unfortunately, there is no bonding support in legacy SRIOV, and our test configuration has bonding enabled, and so this restricts us to only one port of our dual port network interface in the test hardware. And this is clear from the results, where the bandwidth quickly hits a cap of 100 gigabits a second. The other network interface, of course, can be used for Calico or another CNI, providing flexible options alongside the SRIV interface. The state of the art today is for SDN acceleration offloads, as Erez described. We can transfer OVN's SDN flow rules from the host processor to the network card hardware, directly offloading the packet processing work of Open vSwitch from host kernel to network card. This technology combines the flexibility of OVN software-defined networking with the performance of hardware offloading. But does it fulfill this potential? Well, on the left, we see the accelerated OVN in a bare metal Kubernetes environment. And on the right, we see accelerated OVN in OpenStack, running Kubernetes worker nodes as VMs, providing direct access to hardware using the Mac VLAN CNI. In both cases, our single client TCP performance is over 50 gigabits a second, somehow exceeding the performance of the host networking configuration, which is hard to explain, but maybe due to evolutions in our lab setup tuning. With accelerated OVN, we achieve very high performance quickly saturating the 200 gigabits a second available. I should say, the bare metal accelerated OVN graph on the left is actually the best result of five runs. Aggregate performance can be variable, in particular for smaller number of streams in a bonded network configuration. This is likely due to the static nature of lag distribution functions on the bond, creating uneven balance in the flows between the two ports. The same effect would apply to the Mac VLAN chart on the right, but unfortunately we only gathered one result here and didn't have the time to return to this configuration and repeat the experiment. One thing to note is the unfairness apparent in the OVN configuration. The different stripe widths of the bare metal accelerated OVN result imply significant unfairness between clients under contention, which requires some further investigation to understand a little better. One theory is that a reduced number of NIC receive queues used in the OVN virtual functions was leading to uneven performance. Cutting edge developments such as these push the capabilities of today's hardware and software to their limits. A benefit we mentioned earlier of hardware offloading is clear when you examine the host CPU load during the test execution. With the Calico test in the top row here, the system CPU load was measured at about 30% while the tests were underway. 
With accelerated OVN, the CPU load drops to only 15%, giving a delta of 15% of our CPU load between the two CNIs. Now the CPUs we're using in this test are 40 core Platinum Ice Lake Xeons. That's a part with an $8,600 list price. Saving 15% of the CPU cores in this system on a dual socket configuration would be 12 cores or $2,600. If we are working these systems hard, as we really should be, then that's a lot of CPU resource that is not going into our workloads. We can also observe the accelerated OVN flow offloads at work during the benchmarking. In our tests, up to 120 SDN flow rules were offloaded from Open vSwitch to the, from the, in the kernel direct to the NIC hardware. In fact, the Connect X6 can support hundreds of thousands or even millions of hardware offloaded flows. We're barely scratching the surface of this capability here. This can be particularly powerful for advanced networking applications, concurrently serving many thousands of connections. On to the next test. For HPC and AI applications, we usually implement parallelism using a library called the Message Passing Interface, or MPI. This defines how parallel processes can work together by sharing a dataset and communicating efficiently with one another. MPI embodies a very different paradigm. We don't really see so much of this in cloud computing, and it's vitally important for HPC and also large-scale AI. MPI's design also fits naturally with the RDMA network protocols that Erez was describing earlier. The network performance of MPI can be measured using a suite of benchmarks, a standard one of which is called IMB, or the Intel MPI benchmarks. One of the simplest of those benchmarks is a pairwise ping pong in which messages of different size are bounced between processes on two servers. In this benchmark, we are most interested in the latency for transmitting short messages and the bandwidth for transferring large ones. Here we can see the performance of our range of CNIs for the MPI ping pong benchmark. The left chart shows short message latency. Lower is better. The lowest latency is legacy SRIOV at about 1.83 microseconds message latency. To get a lower latency than this, you would need to go to an advanced HPC network fabric like InfiniBand. Accelerated OVN delivers a message latency we measured at about 4.4 microseconds for bare metal and 4.8 microseconds for virtualized OpenStack configurations, quantifying the overhead of virtualization as a small fraction of a microsecond in latency. The right chart shows large message bandwidth. Higher, message, higher is better. The highest performance is accelerated OVN in bare metal and OpenStack configurations. Accelerated OVN on bare metal reaches over 180 gigabits a second bandwidth for transmitting a 32 megabyte message. In both latency and bandwidth, we can see that hardware offloaded configurations perform far better. We can also see clear advantages of RDMA over TCP, both for lower latency and higher bandwidth. On these charts, results for RDMA protocols are marked with pluses, and data points for TCP results are marked with crosses. The difference is clear. So the results for synthetic benchmarks show a clear difference, but what about real world application codes? Computational fluid dynamics, the simulation of air or water flows, for example, is a domain that makes extensive use of parallel programming. OpenFoam is the leading open source code for this. We have a benchmark here where we model the vortices created when a fluid blows over the top of a square box, as shown in this animation. To simulate this scenario, we will use 48 parallel processes that work together using MPI. We also wanted to explore the effect of pod organization. What if we put all the processes in our parallel workload into one pod versus what do we use more pods with fewer processes in each? Within a pod, parallel processes will communicate by using shared memory. Between pods, they should use the local networking, but within the host. Between hosts, they will use the ethernet networking and the CNI. 
we set up a few test cases to explore the effect of this. So how did we get on? In this chart, we are plotting runtime of our fluid dynamics model for different pod to process geometries. In all cases, we used 48 parallel processes. A lower, lower runtime on this graph means better performance. Disappointingly, there's no obvious effect to the different pod configurations. Our lines are pretty flat. Perhaps MPI was smarter than we thought and was using the same shared memory transport both within pods and between pods on the same node. Unfortunately, we did not have time to return to this setup and investigate this further. What is clear, depending on the CNI and protocol used, our simulation took between 125 seconds and 407 seconds to complete. Network performance is clearly a critical factor for parallel simulations such as this. Highest performance was with accelerated OVN and legacy SRI OV. Accelerated OVN yielded about 125 seconds of runtime. Once again, RDMA protocol data points are marked with pluses and TCP data points are marked with crosses. One interesting thing, we can see the hardware accelerated CNIs that supported RDMA protocol have a clear advantage over everything else. But when the same CNIs run with TCP instead of RDMA, the application performance drops from 125 seconds runtime to 244 seconds. That is almost the same runtime as achieved with Calico. The implication here is that the full potential of the hardware accelerated offloads is only fully realized when using RDMA protocols. Once again, the non-offloaded software only OVN is having a hard time in this configuration. A very different but equally intensive workload is genome sequencing, something that played a vital role, of course, in the world's response to the COVID pandemic. We wanted to include a test case for base calling, the first stage in the pipeline for processing data for the DNA sequencer technology developed by companies such as Oxford Nanopore. Base calling uses neural networks to extract base sequences from the noisy signal data from the sequencer device. This application harnesses the machine learning power of a GPU. About a terabyte of signal data is processed for each genome sequenced. Using open source code from Oxford Nanopore, we created a Kubernetes deployment where the base calling process is presented as a service. We wanted to see what effect this would have on sequencing performance. We measured sequencing performance for host networks and also for uh, CNIs. Unfortunately, for lack of time and due to various integration issues, we only managed to run the base calling benchmark on host networking and the Calico CNI. However, what we can see from this single comparison is encouraging. There was no obvious impact to performance for using Kubernetes service networking for base calling. Indeed, the base calling rate was actually about 1% higher when put behind a service IP in Calico, which is hard to explain, but within the margin of variability of the benchmark performance. In summary, we found that Kubernetes platforms perform well for HPC and AI application workloads at the small to moderate scale of our test lab. Kubernetes would make a convenient job execution framework when coupled with interactive software platforms like Jupyter. And this doesn't have to be a compromise of convenience. For infrastructure without SDN acceleration, our experiments showed Calico performed particularly well, although it is hard to separate out the uplift of all the different offloads and accelerations a modern high-end network card will perform. Further work is definitely needed to understand some of the issues we encountered with performance along the way. For the most demanding use cases, SDN acceleration offloads enable the highest performance, supporting the use of RDMA protocols, which our results showed make a significant difference. Our results also showed that with hardware accelerated networking, performance of Kubernetes, both on bare metal hosts and in OpenStack VMs, can be almost indistinguishable from performance on bare metal. With the right networking in place, 
we can harness the advantages of Kubernetes, either on bare metal or in VMs, without sacrificing performance. SDN offloads are now at a coming of age moment, where the technology remains complex, but delivers ultimate performance for cloud native environments. Finally, I would like to say a huge thanks on behalf of Erez and myself to the NVIDIA and Stack HPC engineering teams who performed this research and made this presentation possible. These people are heroes. We hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. Um, please do feel free to scan the QR code here and leave us some feedback. Thanks very much.